and my first time in Korea too. Okay, um, so the title is One Parameter Family of Expanding Wave Solutions of the Einstein Equations that, um, that induces an anomalous acceleration into the standard model of cosmology. So I have to explain all the terms here. So before I do, everything is based on the Einstein equations, okay? So it's, most mathematicians don't know the Einstein equations. I want to give you a quick survey, okay? So, um, so the Einstein equations take the form gij is equal to 8 pi tij. i and j go from 0 to 3, okay? And so the left-hand side is what's called the Einstein tensor, and that depends only on, on the geometry, that is only on the metric and its first and second derivatives. The physics is encoded in the right-hand side, Tij, that's called a stress-energy tensor. So if you want a perfect fluid, then Tij, if you want to do astronomy, then Tij would be a perfect fluid. If you want to do Maxwell's equations, coupled Einstein equations, would be the Maxwell stress-energy tensor, and then you have to supplement it with the Maxwell equations in that geometry. Okay. Now, the hypotheses of Einstein, uh, the, the, the brilliant insight of Einstein is that the gravitational field is the metric Gij in 3 plus 1 dimensional space-time, okay? So he replaces the Newtonian single gravitational potential, and, uh, oh, the metric is, should be symmetric, okay? So he replaces the, the, the Newtonian single gravitational potential by 10 functions, okay? Gij. Okay, and, and at each point, you could diagonalize the metric into the canonical form, minus 1, 1, 1, 1. That's Minkowski space. And, um, and, and, and therefore, it follows, of course, that the metric is convertible. And now, the equations should be tensor equations. So, Coordinates are just an order artifact, okay, and physics shouldn't depend on coordinates, but science nice thing. So tensors are the thing where you have a tensor equation equal to zero, then the same equation equals zero in any coordinate system. Okay, now how do you get this GIJ? Well first what you do is you, you form this three indexed function here, and that's called gamma i gamma kij, and that's um, one half GKS. And the, the, when I raise the indices on the metric, that means you're looking at the inverse metric, okay? So it's GKS, and then it's minus GIJ comma S. The commas here refer to short notation for the partial derivative with respect to excess, okay? So it's minus GIJS, and then you permute the indices, plus GS, um, GSIJ plus GJS comma I, okay? And that's called the Levitschewitz connection. And um, now you take that connection and you form this, this four-indexed animal. It's, a, it's actually a 1-3 tensor, okay? And that's, that's called the Riemann curvature tensor. And you take the partial of gamma IQL with respect to XK minus gamma IQK with respect to XL. So that's sort of like a, like a, a curl term. And then you take gamma I, PK, gamma PQL. Now, we always have summation convention, okay? So here we're summing S, whenever indice appears above and below the line, you always sum it from zero to three. Okay, so this is, this is four terms, this is four more terms, this is four more terms. Okay, and here now, again, gamma I P K respect to gamma P Q L, so you're summing this one from zero to three, and then minus gamma I P L, gamma P Q K, and that's like a commutator term, okay? And you can really see it as a commutator term if you identify things correctly. And curvature is always, always a curl plus a commutator, okay? No matter where you are, vector bundles, anywhere, it's a curl plus a commutator. And that's called the Riemann curvature tensor, pretty complicated animal. And then, uh, and then now you contract, whenever, now you contract on the middle, indice, middle index with the upper index here, this is P and P. And then, again, I'm summing from P going from 0 to 3, and that's Rij, that's called the Ricci tensor, okay? Ricci tensors become very fashionable and famous since Perelman's work, okay? That's the Ricci tensor. And then you contract the Ricci tensor with the inverse of the metric, and it gives you a scalar, that's called the scalar curvature. So Rij 
is, um, I didn't even write down the Einstein tensor here. Let me do that. So the Einstein tensor is, um, it's, so Gij is equal to Rij minus one half R Gij. So now tell me what all these terms are, what R and, um, and Rij is the Ritchie tensor, okay? So, so as you can see, it's a really pretty complicated set of equations. There are 10 equations. The Einstein equations and uh, that's Einstein's tensor, and it's very nonlinear, okay? Very nonlinear. And my colleague Blake Temple, who's my co author on this, calls the Einstein equations the most nonlinear of all nonlinear equations. It really is very nonlinear. Okay, so uh, my, uh, it's joint work with my colleague Blake Temple from UC Davis, okay? And um, the whole thing follows from a really nice idea that. Blake had early on, and then he came to Michigan as a, as a visiting Gehring professor, and then we just proceeded from there, okay? Okay, so, so, so in 19, uh, so let me see, maybe, um, maybe a little uh, preliminary talk here or what it's all about. So in 1927, Hubble, showed that, uh, that the universe is expanding. Distant galaxies are receding from each other, okay? And that confirmed what's called the standard model of cosmology. I'll tell you what it actually is. Standard model of cosmology says that everything evolves according to Friedman, Robertson, Walker metric. All unknown things will be shown early, but I just want to give you an overview. And the Friedman, Robertson, Walker, uh, uh, metric this makes the assumption that, uh, that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic at every point. So homogeneous means that no point is distinct from any other point, and isotropic means no matter where I look, I see pretty much the same thing on the largest scales, okay, on the larger scales. Okay, and that's called, uh, first, so that means first of all that the Earth is not in a special place, and that, that, that homogeneity and isotropy really is what's called the cosmological principle or the Copernican principle, okay? So the FRW metric, the standard model, is based on the, cop on, on the Copernican principle. Now in 1998, okay, so, so, um, so what Hubble did was verify that the st standard model is, is correct, at least from, uh, up to when it was in 1927. Now in 1998, astronomers, um, made more accurate measurements of, um, of the recessional velocities of, of supernovas, the stars that explode, big stars. And they made, they made the astounding announcement that uh, the universe is actually accelerating. Okay, not, it's not received, it's going faster and faster, okay? And, that imply, and that's called the anomalous acceleration of the universe, okay? Now, that, that um, this discovery implies, and I'll show you exactly how that goes, that the standard model is incorrect. So it was good for 75 years, but now it's overthrown, okay? No, no more standard model, okay? And, and the explanation of the acceleration of the universe is, is one of the great uh, unsolved pro problems in physics, okay? It's one of the really important problems. Now, the only way to preserve the FRW framework, that is the standard model framework, and the cosmological principle is to modify Einstein's equations by, by adding on uh, what's called cosmological constant. So you replace this Gij, the Einstein tensor, and you replace it by adding on here plus, a, plus some lambda Gij, and this lambda is called the cosmological constant, So you change Einstein's equations, okay? That change is very, very radical. It means that flat space, Minkowski space, where we're living now, is not a solution of Einstein's equations, okay? It has other bad implications, but okay, that's what they do. Because they love their standard model, and they want to preserve it, and, um, and they want to keep the cosmological principle. 
That's the only way to do it. Okay. Now, so the air ion that formed that, and, and as mathematicians, we call that, let's say it's a fudge factor. There's no physics behind it, they just put it in there. Okay? They just put it in there. And then they fine tune that lambda, and you'll see there's a lot of crazy things there too, as it go on. And, and then they could get the anomalous acceleration, and that leads to a notion of dark energy. So dark energy is an unknown anti-gravitational force, okay, that is hypothesized to make the universe accelerate. No physics, it's just dark energy, you know, it just everything is really ad hoc, okay? Now, uh, for the model to be correct, um, this implies that, um, that, that it accounts for 70 percent, the cosmological constant, the dark energy, accounts for 70 percent of the energy density in the universe, okay? And this is stated as a fact on the NASA website, okay? So NASA is buying into this stuff. Okay, now, now here what I'm going to do is introduce a new family of expanding wave solutions, okay, and explore, I'm going to explore the possibility the, that the anomalous acceleration actually um, um, can be explained without a cosmological constant or without dark energy, just on the basis of the classical Einstein equations. Okay, so that's the background. So now let's, uh, let's, let's move on here. So, so here's the 1998, what the astronomers did. And no explanation is, is, is possible in standard model. I'll tell you standard model one this. And the current physics is dark energy, and it's unobserved, unphysical, anti-gravitational force due to that cosmological constant fudge factor. Okay, and it's very ad hoc. And Temple and I propose a different scenario based on first principles, okay? Not on, not ad hoc. Okay, so here's Einstein's equations again. Maybe you can't see it from the back there. But the Einstein's important great hypothesis is the gravitational field is symmetric in three plus one space time. And, and, and here's the equations that I had. Gij is like k, um, Tij. And this is called the Einstein tensor. And this is called um, the, the sources, OK? Let me get that. Uh, Whoops, what do I do now? Okay, go away. Wait, I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to modify. I get that out of here. So, kill all this stuff. Okay, so we'll kill the dictionary. Not sure how to kill the dictionary. Just the question is. Click on here. Click on here. Here it goes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so now in, in, in astronomy, the Tij represents a perfect fluid. So a lot of the conservation law people know what that is. So it's pressure plus the density, and ui, uj, that's the four velocity, and then plus the pressure times the gij, and that's called the perfect fluid. Okay, and these are all the quantities that come in here. Now, you always have that the divergence of the Einstein tensor is identically equal to zero, okay? Einstein constructed it to have that property. And so on solutions, you must have divergence of Tij equals zero, and that's exactly the relativistic Euler equation. So if you solve the equations, you're also getting the conservation of energy and momentum, okay? So you're getting the right physics, so that's another great thing Einstein had. Now, the standard model of cosmology assumes that the universe homology is an isotropic, and again, it's called the cosmological principle, the Copernican principle, and it's an unverified simplifying hypothesis. Unverified. Okay, and it leads to what's called the FRW metric in the 1920s. Okay, and the FRW metric, the F stands for Friedman, who was a Russian um, meteorologist, and Robertson was an American mathematical physicist, and Walker was an English mathematical physicist. And what Friedman did is, he, on physical grounds, he gave that metric, okay, just on physical grounds. And then in the 1930s, early 1930s, 1931, 32, 
independently Robertson and Walker prove that if you have any homogeneous and isotropic space-time, it must be the FRW metric. Okay, so Friedman was pretty good. He had, uh, he, and it, he was a, not even a mathematician or a physicist, but, you know, in 19, early 1920s, everybody was anybody jumped onto Einstein's equation because they did so many great things. Okay, so here's the, the, the FRW metric. So I'll give you the line elements. So ds squared is equal to minus dt squared plus r of t squared. And then you have dr squared over 1 minus kr squared, then r squared d omega squared. d omega squared is the standard metric on the unit 2 sphere. And r of t is called the cosmological scale factor. And k is a curvature constant. And by, by suitably changing variables here, k could be assumed to be either 0, 1, or minus 1. Okay? Now, inflation, which is something that came out in, in you know, the early, late 1980s, that the universe inflated an enormous amount in, in a tiny period of time, plus observations imply that k has to be equal to zero. So this is all gone now. So at every, at every, at every, um, at every time, dt is out, this is a constant, and this is just the, so it's just a constant time to standard metric. So at every, every, at every time, it's flat space, okay? And it's just expanding by that R of t. Now, there's some notions that we're gonna need later. So what's something called co-moving with the fluid? That means that the velocity vector is just u0 is equal to the square root of minus g0, 0, and that's just, that's just one, because this is minus one here. And then ui are zero for i equal one, two, and three. So what's really going on is this, you're, you're moving with the fluid, and the only thing that's changing is time. Okay, that's called co-moving. And now there's something, um, another thing we'll need later, it's called a redshift, and that's usually denoted by z, and that's lambda zero minus lambda e over lambda e. Lambda is the wavelength, and the zero, or o, should be the observer, and e is the emitted. And then you can write that same expression as in terms of that cosmological scale factor. Now the redshift really is, 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 is really uh, a Doppler effect, okay? So when, a, you know, you hear in the night, you hear the police car go, ooh, it changes, that's, that's stretching out the wave. And that's, um, that's really the exact same thing um, in, in cosmology. Redshift, now, when you're in Earth and you're looking at, at, at some light and you see, let's say, two elements, let's say, carbon and uh, hydrogen or something, and, and you see your spectroscope, so they're, they're a certain distance to, apart. When you turn your telescope out to a distant star and look at the light there, then, then they're, they're, due to the recessional velocity, it gets shifted. It's a bigger shift, okay? Bigger, and that's called the red shift, okay? But it's again, as I say, it's a top of the Now, let's look at the Big Bang cosmology. So at time zero, here was the Big Bang, and then 10 to the 10th seconds, 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, the universe inflated by a factor of 10 to the 40th or something like that. So in that tiny period of time, boom, it came out. And that sounds crazy, and I thought it was crazy too for a long time, but you've got to have something like that other, to resolve certain contradictions. I don't want to get into that. Okay, and now, after that 10 to the 10 seconds, after the inflation rate, it's called the pure radiation epoch, and that's when, that's at that time, the, 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 the electrons and the photons were interacting with each other, they didn't decouple, okay? And that's called the pure radiation epoch. And, and, and that lasted for about 379,000 years after the Big Bang, when the temperature got low enough that, that matter decoupled from radiation, okay? And in, in that period of time, the correct equation of state is P is equal to C squared over 3 times rho, okay? So that's the correct equation of state. And after that, you, you go very quickly to a zero pressure universe. And we, here we are at present time, about 10 to the 11th years after the Big Bang. So that's the Big Bang cosmology. Now, K, remember the K equals zero FRW metric looks just like this, okay? And R bar, which we define to be R of t times little r here, that's arc length distance at time t, so that's the invariant length distance, okay? And Einstein's equation in the, in, in the pure radiation epoch give the Hubble constant, h 
it's called Hubble constant, but it's really not a constant, but you've got to call it a constant. It's been that way for 75 years. So that's really R dot over R, and it comes out to be 1 over 2T, okay? Now, here is why the, the astronomers said that the universe is accelerating. Now, these, these are these three, three graphs here. Now, this, so, so we're plotting something called radiation, redshift versus luminosity distance. I'll explain that later, okay? But I just wanted to give, show you why they, they said the universe is accelerating. So in the standard model, that has to be a straight line. It has to be a straight line. It must. And, and if, you, if you take the, 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 the observations and you assume certain things about the energy density, then what happens, it's no longer a straight line, but it sort, of, it sort of leaves it very quadratically, okay? Looks quadratically, okay? So this is what the redshift versus luminosity relation is, what they saw, they plotted. And that, that contradicts, the, so, so these observations contradict the standard model. So the standard model cannot be correct because it doesn't meet observations. Okay, so it has to be discarded. Less than a long time. Okay, so here it is again. Uh, I, I show it to you, you know, together in one shot here. The standard model, it means that this has to be a linear relation here and it contradicts observations. Now the accepted explanation is what's called dark energy. It's an unobserved anti-gravitational properties. So dark energy is anti-gravitational, so it's pushing things out faster, okay? Accelerating them. And, and that comes from the modifying Einstein's equations by adding on the cosmological constant. Now a recent quote by Oxford astrophysicist, I'll get back to that too, that says, quote, the existence of such an unusual substance is unexpected and requires previously unimagined amount of fine-tuning in order to reproduce the observations. So they got to tune that lambda very finely. You'll see mind-boggling how far. I'll show you later. I don't want to give away the punchline right now. Okay. So our first there is the discovery of an interesting coordinate transformation which takes the FRW, that's the FRW, the, the FRW is like what I showed you, into what's called a standard Schwarzschild form. And that's a metric that looks, you know, just in this form here, A and B. And what's remarkable is A and B depend only on R bar over T bar. So it's a self-similar variable. So here's the theorem. Assume that you have, you're in the pure radiation, F of K is zero. Then under this change of coordinates, okay, the FRW transforms into the sw standard Schwarzschild form of d at dt squared is equal to psi zero of one minus v of psi squared, and psi is equal to, uh, well, is equal to r bar over t, and then the other component is, is, is similar, okay? And, um, and plus the, the, the angular variable, they don't change, okay? So psi is r bar over t, and it's really now, in, in the terms of the metric, this metric over here, it's really 2v over 1 plus v squared, and v is the standard Schwarzschild velocity given by the square root of v over a, v and a, or these guys, times you can use 1 over u0, and here u bar, u0, u1, is the, is, the, is the t and r components of the force velocity of the sources, the tij, in the standard Schwarzschild coordinate. tij has to be modified to it. Now the constant psi 0 I'm including here to later account for time rescaling freedom in the SSC form of the Einstein equations. Okay, now what are the expanding wave equations? So you take the SSC metric on that and you put it into Maple and you get these Einstein equations, okay? So, so the, the, you see they're, they're really pretty um, nonlinear square and then, then this phi in here is really a complicated nonlinear expression here and these are the Einstein equations, okay? Now, in smooth solutions, A through D, these guys here, and E is because of that factor here, they're equivalent to A to C, and the divergence of Tij is equal to zero. Divergence of Tij, the points of covariant divergence, can be written in the locally inertial form here, it's a little bit complicated, where Tm is the Minkowski tensor, okay? So, that's the equivalence. 
So I assume that A is equal to a function of that sense of self-similar variable, and similarly B is a function of that variable, that then these, the A through C that I just gave are equivalent to three ODEs, that's A to C and plus F, and, 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 and where, where F is, is, is a constraint that represents a consistency condition by taking the equations A sub C from both the first and the second equations. They both have to solve for A sub C, I understand D equal, so they get this consistency condition. Okay? And if I define W by, by kappa over 3, kappa is just a universal constant here, and, and I make E times 1 minus B squared inverse, and E is the square root of AB over C, changing variables to make the equations a little simpler. A long calculation shows that the three ODs that I had on the other slide, the previous one, look like this. So C, A sub C is equal to E times this, and C, E sub C is equal to E times this guy here, this complicated expression in terms of V, E, and, uh, and A. And then finally, C, V, C, C is equal to this expression here. Now this is much more complicated. This is bracket N here is this quantity here, and bracket D that comes over here is this quantity here. And the constraint becomes kappa W is equal to 1 minus A over 3B squared plus 4VE. Okay, so these equations. So now, so now here's the second theorem. Assume that A, E, and V solve the Einstein equations, the ODEs, and use 4 to define the energy density, okay, like this. Then this metric that I just had on here for A and B solves the Einstein equation with the equation of state V equal rho C squared over 3. And the transformation, the original transformation of the FRW metric gives the following special relations which hold on the standard model during the radiation phase. So in the standard model, A is just 1 minus V squared. E is 1 over psi 0 times, uh, psi 0 times psi. And, and, and psi is equal to this, where psi 0 is an arbitrary constant. Now another long calculation shows that the equation, the FRW equations, indeed satisfy the original equations with the constraint star. Okay? Now, somebody who's really competent in, in, in computers could probably get that fast. We don't trust our computing powers. We did it by hand. <laughs> it took a long time. OK, now you conclude that the standard model of cosmology during the radiation phase corresponds to a solution of those three SSS, SSC PDEs, which we could write as ODEs, plus the constraint. And again, the parameter psi accounts for time scaling freedom. If you take t bar into psi zero t bar, that preserves solutions, the equation, and the constraint. Okay? Now I want to make a little comment here. Years ago, about ten years ago, Blake and I, Temple and I, proved the first found the first shockwave solutions of Einstein's equations. Okay, general Einstein's equations. And of course we're conservation guys, we want to look for look for expanding wave solutions. Couldn't find them. It's too hard. You can't take that ansatz and put it into the Einstein equation. There's too many equations. You, you can't do it. And uh, in fact, to tell you a little story, that when, in 2005, when I was at uh, the Einstein Centenary in Zurich, okay, at the ETH, I was up in Tal in Malin's office, and uh, and he asked me, he's a smart guy, you know, he asked me, could there be a self-similar solution of Einstein's equations? And I'll say. I can't believe it, but uh, nobody found it in 75 years. Well, you know, it can't be. And uh, I just dismissed it. I can't do it. But I was wrong. There is a self similar solution. But you can't get it just by looking for one. You have to have an ansatz to play with it and stuff like that. And then you can get it. And the ansatz that came, what we found, was when we, when we transformed the coordinates on the standard F, uh, FRW metric. That opened the door for us. Okay, and that gave us the expansion waves. It's too hard to do it, at, you know, right from the beginning. Okay, now the next step is interesting. So if model of this scaling, okay, then distinct solutions of, of the equations describe a two-family, per-parameter family of distinct space times. Here's the theorem. So if I make that scaling replacement, that takes, that takes the A, E, and V into A, C over 
C of a psi zero E of C of a psi zero and V, same thing. And the scaling preserves the solution. Moreover, this is the interesting part. This is the only scaling law in the sense that any two solutions of those equations not related by this scaling here describe distinct space times. Okay. All right. So there are interesting consequences of this mathematically, but I won't go into it. Now the equations A through C admit three initial value parameters, because they're ODs, and one scaling law. So it follows that the equations and the scaling law, and, 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 and this, this uh, consistency condition describe a two-parameter family of distinct space times, OK? All right? So we have a, scale, a free scaling parameter. So we have three, you know, three constants, but now we only have two. So next show, by imposing regularity at the center, psi equals zero, a further reduction to a one-parameter family of expanding wave solutions results, one of which is the standard model with pure radiation sources. So let's first talk a little bit about, I'll, I'll show you that theorem in a moment. Let's talk about the leading order corrections to the standard model. To get the leading order corrections applied by the original PDE, we linearize the equations about the FRW and expand to leading order about the center psi equals zero. So modulo a scaling law, the linearized e equations admit two solutions, one which blows up at the origin and the other is nicely behaved. It's just like, you know, when you look at vessel type equations, one blows up and one, one is nice and you throw away the one, the blow up one, it's a similar thing. Okay, so, so getting rid of that singular solution leaves a two-parameter family, which I include the time scaling law, okay? So, so here's the theorem. Two-parameter family of bounded solution of the Einstein equations that extend the FRW into standard Schwarzschild coordinates given in terms of two parameters, psi zero and A, to leading ordering psi by, and here's the, the, the metric um, line element, dt square of one of psi square, and then here one minus A, and then you have v0 square over 4, and similarly over here, okay? Where a is equal to 1 minus, where I define a to be 1 minus a square psi 0 square v0 square over 4, plus the error of order a minus 1 times c to the 4. Now, all error terms are not just from getting asymptotic expansions. They're rigorous. Every o that comes in is a rigorous error term. So, um, so, so, and V looks like this. So it's the, it's the, it's the FRW to leading order, and the error again is psi to the third. Psi zero is that time scaling parameter. A equal one gives the FRW. If I put A equal one in here, I get FRW back. And A not equal to one is a new acceleration parameter and gives leading order perturbations of FRW. Per, around A equal one, you got the leading order perturbations. And the velocity is independent of a leading order in C. That'll come in useful later. So uh, it's correct to the back percentile. So uh, I'm, it's hard to read the formula for the line element, but the A would be up here in there somewhere, or? Yeah, A is right there. Uh, so That's A. And right here, too. Okay. I see, so these, the, the capital A would be where these drive quantities. Yeah, right, and little a is the a new parameter, right. right. Okay, so, um, so we, get, we want to get the leading order correction, so we discard that, that, that scaling law. So and here's the case. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. No, I'm going the right way. We just did that, and here is what um, I was just asked on the A. Okay. So one more question. And these, these new metrics that you're writing down, they're still, um, they still satisfy these homogeneity and isotropy? No! They don't, okay. It's a unique solution that satisfies the homogeneity. It's A for one. And so what's That's the, the only solution that was proved by those guys. Okay, so then the right-hand side here of Einstein's equation is still a perfect fluid? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, everything's perfect fluid. We're doing astrophysics. Always perfect fluid. That's Einstein. Einstein introduced that. Okay. So, uh, so the FRW, from the FRW equations, when A equals 1, the metric reduces exactly 
to uh, the FRW metric. This is the FRW metric we started it with. And the SSC coordinate representation depends only on the Hubble constant and R bar, which are both invariant under the scaling R to alpha R of the FRW metric, which I'll show you again. So the scale SSC representation of the FRW, therefore, we go through the net, is independent of the choice of the time scale of, of R of T. So without loss of generality, you can take psi zero equal to one, and always assume that the FRW metric is scaled exactly so that this is the, the cosmological scale factor. Okay? So that's that time scaling freedom that we have at so we equal to one. Okay, so the leading order, the one parameter family, one parameter family, expanding wave perturbation of the FRW metric is given by this. I think this is bigger. You can see the end now. Right, Robert? I can see the yeah. Come closer. Okay. <laughs> Here it is. With errors of order uh, A minus 1 times psi to the fourth, and A equal 1 corresponds exactly to FRW. Moreover, the velocity is given to leading order by this with errors of, of order psi q. Okay? So, so, so now we have, we have now a, a curve of metrics, okay? Every point on that curve depends, it, it gives a, a new, new space-time, okay? When A is equal to 1, you get the old FRW back, okay? So the, the old FRW metric is embedded in a one-parameter family of, of space-times, okay? So that's the way to think of it. Now let's go to co-moving coordinates compared with the standard model. So, so V independent A to leading order means that the inverse of our radial transformation gives to leading order a co-moving system for MA, those are the, 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 met, the metric where A is not one, and allowing us to compare the Hubble constant of redshift versus luminosity relation, which I haven't told you about that yet, but I will. To MA, for MA when A is not equal to one to the same thing when FRW, and as measured by the FRW metric, okay? So here's what we get. So here's the theorem. The inverse of the coordinate transformation takes MA, the metric of A, over the TR coordinates and into this form here, where that F now is 1 plus A squared minus 1 zeta squared over 4 plus era zeta 4 times A minus 1. And the SSC velocity maps to this velocity here, okay? Now the errors in, in, in 1 and 2 are written in terms of the co-moving coordinate zeta. Remember, always the errors are rigorous errors. Zeta, which by, when you look at the transformation, satisfies zeta is equal to r bar over t now, and that's, that's you could show that's of order of c as c goes to zero. And again, r bar is, is, is the area of the sphere of symmetry, okay? And, and exactly measures arc length at t equal to constant when A is 1. Okay. So for first comparison of the A not equal to 1 to the A equal 1, so define the Hubble constant at A by H depending on T and zeta as 1 over R sub A times the derivative R sub A, the T derivative. Now just like the Hubble constant, the R now is the coefficient of the dr squared term. So, so when A is 1, this will give you back the ordinary Hubble constant. And now you can, then you can show that this HA is equal to 1 over 2T times 1 minus 3A, A squared minus 1, A squared plus fourth order error. So, so and, and notice when A is equal to 1, you get back just 1 over 2T, standard model. And the fractional change in the Hubble constant induced by nearby expanding waves relative to the Hubble constant 1 over 2T of the FRW metric is H0 minus H over h is equal to 3 h 1 minus a squared zeta squared plus order of, 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 of zeta to the fourth, okay? So when a is 1, this right-hand side is 0, so h 0, <coughs> h of a is equal to h. a is what it should. Okay, now zeta is interesting. It's a natural dimensionless param perturbation parameter and has physical interpretation in TR coordinates. Of course, let's say assume that the speed of light is 1 and t is equal to c times t. Zeta goes from 0 to 1 as r bar ranges from 0 to the horizon distance. That the furthest one can see from the center at time t units from the Big Bang. Okay, like we're there, as far as we can see, because the speed of light is finite. And that's approximately equal to the Hubble length, c over t. And so zeta is really the distance over the Hubble length, r bar for the Hubble length. 
So if you expand in zeta, you get an expansion in the fractional distance of the Hubble length. Okay? Now, a different mapping gives, um, gives more insight into that metric, m star, m star, well, here it is again. I always put it so you can remember it. So when a is not equal to 1, namely, if we extend the FRWTR coordinates to a not equal to 1 by an analogous transformation that we first had before, a equal 1 gives us standard model. So we get the new metric ds squared equal to minus dt squared t to the a plus r bar squared the omega squared plus a mixed term, okay, an off-diagonal term in the metric. Now this new coordinate is not co-moving coordinate system for our ordinary metric to leading order, but, but this metric takes the form of a k equals zero frw metric with a small correction to the scale factor, r r of a is the square root of this thing here, so that's just t to the a over 2 instead of t to the 1 half, and a small mixed term correction, okay? In particular, time slices in that metric, t equal a constant, become just this, t is a constant, and they agree with the frw metric modified by the scale factor r sub a. So that means that this metric exhibits many of the space-time properties of frw. The, the geometry properties. For example, it gives a space-time foliation by three metrics. Other nice things happen to it. Okay. So you want to say the geometry. Now here's the here is the, the real phase on that. This, this is the real reason that this is interesting. So now we have to look at redshift versus luminosity. Remember that was where that curve that they observed broke away from the straight line that the FRW had. Okay? So here's the goal. So we want to get the first order corrections to the redshift versus luminosity relations, FRW, measured by an observer at the center of the expanding wave space-time. These are the, the, this is the one parameter family of space-time which, which, in which the standard model is embedded with a single point. So the fairly correct coordinates to do the expect comparison should be called moving with respect to the sources. So we strip to TR coordinates defined by the transformation, our original transformation. And therefore, the one parameter failing expanding wave is described by the metric that we just had. Again, a reminder, there's too many metrics, so I always write down the metric. So, oops, I put them all right So now, so assume radiation is emitted by a source at time t sub e, at wavelength lambda e, and received by an observer at the center at later time t0 at wavelengths lambda zero. Now define L with capital L absolute luminosity, which is energy emitted by the source over time. Let, um, let little l be what's called the apparent luminosity, the power received over the area. And then d sub l is the luminosity distance. That's what, the thing we're going to plot in the y-axis versus z. And that's L over 4 RT, uh, RL to the 1 half, OK? Now, in, in, for the FRW, these things in, you find in, in in some of the modern textbooks, okay? So that's what we learned about this stuff. Okay, but we have to modify all this because of the, um, because A is not one. And Z is the redshift factor. So now, using two serendipitous properties of the metric star, that is diagonal and co-moving coordinates, and no alpha depends on the sphere of symmetry, so here's what we get. We modify the A equal one result to obtain the following. The redshift versus luminosity relation is measured by an observer position at the center of the spinning wave space-time determined by that metric, MA, which we had before. It's given to fourth order in the redshift factor as the following. So DL is equal to 2 T0 times Z, and then A squared minus 1 over 2 Z squared, and then A squared minus 1 times 3 A squared plus 5 over 6 times Z cubed plus the fourth order error. In our parameter, in, in our PNAS paper, we didn't have this term yet. That took a long time to get. And DL is called the luminosity distance. A is the acceleration parameter. A equal 1 corresponds to the FRW. OK, so as I said, we improved the redshift versus luminosity relation to third order. And this is a significant extension and requires refined estimates near the center and resolution of what we call the mirror problem. The mirror problem is the problem of accounting for a dimming of light from distant sources due only to the curvature of the A not equal to 1 space-time in the expanding waves. 
This is a geometric effect. And this effect is not present in the standard model, and it's too weak to influence the second order correction in our original PLAS paper. And uh, th that, that calculation, that third order term, took us a year. Okay, it, it's, put, we didn't work together all the time, but you know, we spent at least six times during the year, every week, each time, working hard. <laughs> So now let's make some notes. If A is 1, the, the, the redshift versus luminosity gives you the linear relation, which is correct for the standard model. And in, in the bracket, in, in, in the redshift versus luminosity relation, that is, this bracket here gives the leading order um, uh, yeah, the third order. So, so you get so the bracket in, in there gives, gives the leading order quadratic and cubic corrections to the, to the redshift versus luminosity implied by the change in the Hubble constant corresponding A not equal to 1. Now since A squared minus 1 appears in front of the second order correction and the third order correction, it follows that the second order part of any anomalous acceleration to stand the model can be accounted for by suitably adjusting that parameter A. Okay. I'll talk about the physics behind that in a moment. Now, the third order correction is in a prediction of the theory. Okay? We tell the astronomers, refine your observations and see if you can get that third order correction. Does it match with our, what we get? That's a, that we have a prediction. Okay? We don't know yet if it does that. So, so in particular, note that when A is not equal to 1, the leading order corrections imply a blue shifting, that means fast, less fast, relative to the radiation relative to the standard model as observed by the astronomers in the supernova data. So here's the, the change in the redshift versus the luminosity again. And note that the sign of the third order term is positive, and, and the, so the third order term further increases the effect of the quadratic term and displaces the redshift versus luminosity relation from the standard model. So here we see that they, to get the redshift versus luminosity, they have to put in this artificial cosmological constant, and that leads to this, this unphysical notion of dark energy. You know, it's making out dark energy, something that's accelerating everything out there. I think they just wouldn't dare do things like that. Of course, it's the way we string theory, for example. Okay. So let me give some concluding remarks. We constructed a one-parameter family of, of general relativistic expanding waves, which contains the FRW, and was made possible by a nice coordinate transformation. Now, the main point for us mathematicians is the coordinate mapping explicitly defines the self-symbol invariance and the metric on ansatz. Okay, you can't do it. It's not evident from FRW, and it gives us an expanding wave solution with the Einstein equations, which we couldn't get trying to do it, look for it without having a crutch. Didn't really opened it up for us. So the self-similarity uh, of, of FRW in the standard Schwarzschild coordinates enables the Einstein equations to transform to a new system of ODEs in a self-similar variable, which embeds the FRW in a three-parameter family expanding wave solution of Einstein equations. The three-parameter family reduces the one parameter by removing a time-scaling variance at size zero and imposing regularity at the center. The remaining parameter, A, changes the expansion rate of the space-times, and so we call A the acceleration parameter. Okay. Now, transforming the co-moving back to co-moving coordinates, we get this redshift versus luminosity relation. Okay? So we could get that fit by getting taking A. Now, the leading order part of any anomalous correction to, to the standard model can be accounted for by adjusting A. And now, here's so we have an idea of, of some physics behind. These results suggest a conservation law scenario of the Big Bang. So there's a lot of conservation law people in the audience, a couple of our conservation law guys. So it's well known that highly interactive solutions of conservation laws decay to non-interacting waves, shocks and expansion waves, by the mechanism of shock wave dissipation, even if the dissipation terms are neglected in the equations for the order period. There's dissipation built in intrinsically because of shockwave interaction and energy increase. Okay, so there's dissipation in there. And that's why you know black symbol all of entropy increase. 
So a reasonable conjecture, decay to a non-interacting expansion wave could have occurred during the radiation phase of the standard model via the highly nonlinear evolution driven by the high sound speed, okay, in this equation of state. Since the FRW is just one point in a family non-interacting expansion wave, some further explanations needed as to why, at least on some length scale, decay would not proceed to an A not equal to one member of this family expansion. Why did they go to A equal one? What the hell? What's so holy about A equal one? It's mathematically, it's as good as any other one. So if decay to A not equal to one did occur, then the galaxy was formed after the radiation phase, remember that's 379,000 years after the Big Bang, would be displaced from their anticipated positions in the standard model at the present time. Now, if this displacement would lead to a modification of the observed redshift versus law velocity relation, and this could account for the anomalous acceleration of the galaxies observed in the supernova day. We're going to see if that third order prediction works, okay? But it could, it could account for everything. I don't want to say it does, but I think it does. Based on mathematical theory of conservation laws, everything, nonlinear arities alone can generate dissipation that in time will drive chaotic disturbance into a non-interactive self-similar expansion. We argue that the complicated behavior in the pure radiation area, era, is driven by the high sound speed, the square root of that c square over 3, in this equation of state, coming from the initial disturbance from the Big Bang. So it's like the orderly concentric circles of waves which emerge in time on the surface of a pond after a rock disturbed the surface with a chaotic plump. So you drop a rock in there, then for an instant there's all chaos going on in there, it's really complicated. But then all these nice circles come out eventually, if they, if everything is just self-similar, okay? That's analogous to what we have. The word plunk came from my wife, it's a good word for this. <laughs> okay, the, now the stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies are evidence of small-scale variations that violate the cosmological principle on the smaller length scale. Every way you look at it, it's not the same, right? I mean, there's different things on that length scale. Now, so they say go out beyond that. So everything should be FRW. Our solution violates the cosmological principle since the center of the expansion is distinguished. But we argue that there could be even larger length scale behind, beyond those, those, what we see now, that, that the, clusters of, in the clusters of galaxies on which local decay to one of our expanding waves occurred and we happen to be at the center one. It's possible, okay? It's a physical explanation, you know. Now, may, now if A is not equal to one, the space-time has a center because it's an expanding wave, okay? And that's a violation of the Copernican principle a simplifying assumption generally accepted in cosmology. So if the Earth did not lie within some threshold of the center, the expanding wave theory would apply large angular variations in the observed data. Now in a recent paper by these three guys, Oxford physicists, actually two guys and a woman, in, in PhysRev Letters 2008, which was discovered by this, we never knew about this thing, Blake Temple's wife was, was um, was, was uh, actually, you know, playing around with the web, and she looked at the news uh, record, the news on the, um, on the, um, on the Fox Network news, Fox Network, the whole thing, and she found this paper, they referred to this paper on science news on Fox Network, God, okay, so here's the quote, the cosmic microwave background radiation supply us with a tight constraint that we must be within 15 megaparsecond of the center of the void. So if we're within 15 megaparsecond, we'll see the same thing. Not, you don't have to be the same point. Now, 15 megaparseconds is enormous. It's, the, it's approximately equal to the distance between clusters of galaxies. So it's approximately 1 200th the size of the observable universe. It's humongously big. Okay. So the cosmological, now what, 
discuss. So the problem we have, and they say, well, you have to be toward the center, and therefore, uh, blah, blah, blah. okay. But the cosmological problem, constant and dark energy have major problems, too. It's the fine-tuning problem, motivated by the enormous discrepancy between the theoretical prediction of the cosmological constant lambda and its measured value. 60 orders of magnitude smaller than the theoretical prediction. 60 orders of magnitude different. 10 to the 22 is, is, is more than all the grains of salt sand on the Earth. This is 60. It's unbelievable. Okay, but they love it. They still want They have nothing else to do. They've got to take it. They've got to accept it. Now, there's another problem. It's called the cosmic coincidence problem. Why do we live in an era when the densities of dark energy and matter are almost equal? How did that happen? Too coincidental. So now, in the Scientific American of, of one year ago, April 2009, actually, the cover article is dark energy. Does it really exist? Or does the Earth occupy a very unusual place in the universe? OK? So they, that's where these guys wrote this popular magazine article after their, their, their paper came out. They had a paper exploring these things, but they had no mathematics, and they were just talking about it. And uh, so that's something, a, a nice issue to, to, to look at. There's also a nice article here about the vanishing of the beach. What? Those are the three people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The two of them wrote the article. I, I think the one was a postdoc or something like that. But that's a nice, interesting art thing to get, because you see why the bees are dying. <laughs> so that's more than this is. OK, now, now here, here's a, 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 you know, Los Alamos, um, 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 you know, website. Uh, and and it, the title is, this is now, the date is December, December, I can't remember, uh, 20th of December. 2009, last December. So comparison of dark energy uh, models, a perspective from the um, latest cosmological data. So here, here's the quote I take out on this page. Many cosmologists expect that the identity of dark energy and the cosmological constant that fits the observational data well. Many, and they all accept that. Well, one also has reason to dislike the cosmological constant since it always suffers from, now these are Chinese guys, right? So they're English. Ones. So however they should really say that while. Um, however, one also has has reason to dislike the cosmological consciousness. It suffers from the theoretical problems such as the fine-tuning and cosmological coincidence problems, puzzles. The fine-tuning problem, also known as the old cosmological problem, is 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 motivated by the enormous discrepancy between theoretical prediction for the cosmological constant and its measured value, the so-called cosmological constant problem. Namely, the, the cosmic coincidence, that was the, co the cosmic coincidence problem, the question is why we just live in an era when the densities of dark energy and matter are almost equal. That indicates that the cosmological constant scenario may be incomplete. Now, about a week later, and, and again, that Los Alamos archive is another uh, dark energy paper, and this is written by uh, some some French physicist now, who's in the uh, the, the, the Boudin famous observatory in Paris, and he says here, dark energy confronts us with a compatibility problem, since in order to save the phenomena of the observations, we have to include new ingredients, constant cosmological concept or matter fields or, or interactions that are complicated beyond those of our established physical theories. However, the required value for the simplest dark energy model, that's the lambda cosmological constant here, um, is, is, is more than 60 orders of magnitude smaller than what is expected on theoretical grounds. So here's a statement in, in, in the literature. And that came like five days or oh, 10 days after that other paper. So the extend expansion wave theory that we present is, can be tested, but at third order. Of course, it in principle could give an explanation for the observed anomalous acceleration with a classical GR. In our expansion wave theory, the anomalous acceleration, not acceleration at all, but it's just a correction to the standard model due to the fact that we're looking out into an expansion wave. Okay? Our theory is not ad hoc since the apparent acceleration is derivable exactly from first principles 
based on a mathematically rigorous theory of suspension. Unlike dark energy, it does not require the ad hoc stuff in the universe is filled with an unobserved form of energy with anti-gravitational properties arising from the interpretation of the cosmological constant in order to fit the data. Now, the idea that the anomalous acceleration might be counted by a local London density expansion weight in a neighborhood of our galaxies was expounded in this physical letter by those three guys. So finally, our new expanding wave solutions provide a new paradigm for testing against the standard model. That's it.